Hi, I'm clinical psychologist Dr. Ali Matu, and in this video, I'm walking you through the steps of finding the right therapist for you, based on my over 15 years of experience of being a therapist myself. As a therapist myself, I get this question a lot. Hey Ali, can you help me find a therapist that's the best fit for me? And I hate getting this question because this process is horrible. It's really hard to find a therapist, let alone someone who's a good fit, let alone someone who, who you can actually afford and make their schedule work. It's very hard for all those things to align up. And there's a lot of reasons why the mental health system, at least in the United States, is very broken. It's underfunded. Therapy is a secretive process. No one really knows much about what's happening behind the closed doors of a therapist's office. Most of us don't have experience going to therapy, which is very different than going to see a physician, which we all do from the moment we are born. And people don't talk about therapy, about therapists they go to, about their experience in mental health. And so for all of these reasons, finding a therapist is a very nebulous, hidden, secretive process. And I'm hoping this video gives you some tools to make that secretive process a little bit more clear, a little bit more transparent, and at the very least, a framework of how to tackle this very stressful problem. I know this is a long video, there's a lot of detail here, so I split it up into four different sections. Section one is about how to know what you can afford. In section two, we're gonna explore the process of how to find a therapist. Part three then gets into the questions you wanna ask a potential therapist. And last but not least, it's about how to make a decision if this therapist is the right fit for you. One little footnote I wanna include right here. This advice is based on my experience being a therapist in the United States. Some of this advice will apply to other countries. Some of it will not. So, you know, be careful with this advice. It may or may not apply to the region of the world where you live. Before you even start looking, the first thing you have to understand is what can I afford? So if you have health insurance, you need to talk to your insurance and see what type of mental health coverage do you have? What type of professionals are covered? Um, how do you access those professionals? Can you see someone who is out of your network? Can you get that reimbursed? Do you have to submit the reimbursements? Um, what problems are covered? How long can you get treatment? Um, how long do those, uh, does that treatment need to be? Is it 45 minutes? Is it 60 minutes? These are all the kind of things that you need to have a pretty good understanding of. Ideally, these are the kind of questions we should be asking for all of our health insurance, but we tend not to because in general, health insurance has covered physical problems more than mental health related concerns. Even though it's illegal now for insurance agencies to discriminate based on mental health uh, problems, a lot of insurance companies still try to, and they're still kind of shady about what they cover. The process is again, healthcare in, in the United States is very secretive, very nebulous, but it's even more secret and nebulous with mental health. So arm yourself with knowledge about what can I afford, what can't I afford? If you don't know that, you might end up going to see a therapist, you might end up paying for it, you might end up realizing my insurance won't cover it, and now you're stuck. And now you're two, three, four, five sessions in with this therapist that you can't afford, and you might be considering bailing on that and starting all over from scratch. You don't wanna get into that position. Start with the knowledge of what you can and cannot afford. The first place to start when you're looking for a therapist is to talk to the healthcare providers you already see 
and trust. This might be a physician you go to every year for your annual checkups. Maybe it's a physical therapist you see for some type of injury that you've experienced. Maybe it's a dentist, maybe it's a nurse practitioner, but whoever you regularly see for healthcare, if you see someone regularly for healthcare, talk to them. They likely will know people in the nearby area or at least will have clinics or other areas in the healthcare system that they're connected to where they can at least point you in the right direction. This is the, the first place to go to if you already have some type of connection with healthcare, use that connection to see if you can find someone who might be a good fit for you. The other reason why you wanna start with a healthcare provider you already know is there might be some specific things that they can do themselves to help you with the mental health concern you might be struggling with, whether it's insomnia or some stress, anxiety, um, mild depression, these kinds of things are um, sometimes in the wheelhouse of the healthcare professionals you already see, and they might have ways to at least make a first attempt at helping you with this problem. Next, look at what resources are already available to you. If you're a college student, you probably have access to some type of counseling center on campus. Now, some counseling centers have more availability to work with you on a longer term basis. Some counseling centers are really stretched very thin and can only really do triage and emergency support. But regardless of that, if you are a college student, you're already paying for services that you might not be taking advantage of, like going to a counseling center. The confidentiality around going to get mental health services on a college campus, the, the laws on that are even more strict than the laws of going to a hospital. There's something called FERPA, which goes into effect when you're in the college setting. So that information is so secure. And if you have any concerns about your parents finding out that you're going to a counseling center, that's not really what happens. You have a lot of confidentiality and you're probably already paying for the service. You might also, if you, if you have a full-time job and you receive benefits, you might have access through your employee assist assistantship program, EAP, or other health benefits to access some type of, of therapy. Lately, it's kind of the, the hot trendy thing, especially here in Silicon Valley, to make some type of mental health support through an app available to employees as a benefit. So talk to your HR, talk to your benefits officer to see what type of mental health support is already available to you as an employee. And if you're a student in elementary, middle, and high school, you might have access to a counselor on site who might be able to help you with some of the basics. Or you might even have access to a school psychologist, a social worker at school. Uh, there's a lot of diversity in terms of what resources schools have to support you. So see what's available to you. Confidentiality is a little bit different when you are under 18 years of age. But what I always encourage people to do is go to see a counselor on site at school, ask them about how confidentiality works here at your school, in your state, state to state, the laws vary on this stuff very significantly. So find out what the rules are and what's available to you. You might have resources somewhere around that you're already paying for and don't even realize are available to you. You can also talk to people you trust, talk to family, friends, see if any of them go to see a therapist and who they might recommend. A lot of times I got um, referrals for people who wanted to see me just based on the fact that I saw one of their friends or another family member. And yeah, sometimes I would have to refer them to a colleague because I don't want to be seeing two, uh, two brothers or, you know, it, it would make things a little bit difficult. But the cool thing is when you talk to a therapist, they always know other therapists that they can recommend you to. So talk to family and friends, see if there's anyone that they like, and then you can talk to those people and at least they can point you in the right direction uh, if you don't wanna see that specific person for confidentiality reasons or just awkward reasons and you don't wanna run into your 
friend or family member in the waiting room. I would also look at reputable mental health organizations. All the big mental health problems, whether they're anxiety or um, hair pulling disorder, tics and Tourette's, they all have associated organizations that are doing the work of helping to educate the public about these types of problems, are helping people to get connected with expert clinicians that know how to treat these problems. So for example, for anxiety, there's the ADAA, and then the TLC Foundation for BFRBs, Body Focused Repetitive Behaviors, that's like hair pulling, skin picking, nail biting, that kind of stuff. These organizations often have a list of mental health providers in different areas of the country that know about these problems, that have some type of vetting that would be a great place to get started and to reach out to those individuals and see if they have availability. Two of my favorite mental health organizations, SAMHSA and NAMI, have helplines available for you to call and get expert help in navigating the mental health system and finding someone who might be a good fit for you. I'm also a big fan of ABCT, which is the major cognitive behavioral therapy association. They have a referral system as well. You can go and find a therapist that way. And if you're looking for a child therapist, I really like effective child therapy as a way of finding someone who might provide effective child therapy. So if you're overwhelmed by all of this, reach out to these organizations, reach out to the helplines. I got the information in the doobly-doo below and take advantage of this amazing free resource. Then there's the overwhelming world of online directories. And I know the associations I just talked about have online directories, but then there's even bigger ones, like Psychology Today is one of the biggest ones in the United States. There's also the online directories available from your insurance company. Um, there's even more than that. And, and there's these matching services, like in many ways, Talkspace and BetterHelp are these matching services that you can go in and you can kind of find a therapist who might be a good fit. I think all of these are wonderful places to start. The challenge is a lot of those therapists tend to be very full and they might not have availability, but sometimes it's the only way to, find, to kind of quickly find people who might take your insurance, who are in your area, and even if they're full, you can call those therapists and ask them if they know of other colleagues in the area who might be able to see them. And I keep saying in the area, but in this new world of pandemic life, most therapists have transitioned completely to doing online treatment, um, video face-to-face -face eye contact treatment, asynchronous eye contact treatment, that kind of stuff. And um, in general, that seems to be pretty effective for a lot of people. There's some people for whom it's not a good fit, uh, especially if you deal with a lot of distractibility and organization issues. It might not be a good fit, but and for some people who deal with a lot of distraction and uh, disorganization problems, it might be a good fit because you can just do it from the comfort of your own home. You kind of need to see if it works for you and different therapists have different limitations. Sometimes if people need a higher level of support than just one-on-one -on -one treatment or if they're dealing with more moderate to severe problems, those therapists might insist that you come in in person. So talk to people, find out. But what I'm trying to say here is needing to find someone who's local to you kind of doesn't matter anymore. In most situations, you do want to find someone who's at least in the same state as you. Licenses in mental health are limited state by state. So for example, when I worked in New York City, I couldn't practice across the river in New Jersey or in Connecticut. Um, even though we we're so close in geographic location, I could only really practice within the confines of New York State. So try to find someone who is in the same state as you. Let's talk about low cost options because for a lot of people, mental health is just not accessible. There isn't a therapist in your area, the schedule doesn't line up, they don't have any openings, and the biggest drawback for a lot of people is the cost. They're underinsured, don't have health insurance, or just can't afford um, the rates of a therapist. So what do you do then? Well, the first thing to think about is what mental health agency is available 
in your local area. In most areas, there is some type of government-sponsored mental health agency that provides low-cost, if not free treatment available to people who meet the criteria for their services. Sometimes a criteria might be you have Medicare, Medicaid. Sometimes a criteria might be you are underinsured or you have a certain range of income. But find out what the criteria is for these different mental health agencies. Just do a Google search for your local region and mental health authority, mental health agency, see what pops up, give them a call, ask them what their criteria for services are. You should also look for training clinics. These are areas in universities as well as hospitals where therapists in training go to get the necessary experiences they need to get their license. And at first you might be thinking, I don't wanna see an inexperienced therapist. Inexperienced therapists are amazing. Therapists in training are some of my favorite favorite people because they have a lower caseload. They're seeing less patients, so they have more time to think about you. And also, it's not just them, but their supervisor, who is probably some type of expert or highly experienced clinician, who is also listening to the audio recordings, watching videos, reviewing everything that's happening week to week in your treatment. So it's almost like you're getting an extra pair of eyes and more rested, less overwhelmed pair of eyes looking at you and what you're going through. Therapists and training are amazing. So call up your local universities, call up your local uh, hospitals, do a search for um, therapy training clinic in, in your geographic area and see what pops up. A lot of times you can get free or very low cost treatment that is super high quality treatment by going to a training clinic. If you find someone you really like but their fee is too high, you can always negotiate with them. When I was practicing full-time as a therapist, there were certain hours of the day that everyone wanted to come in. Usually 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 p.m. Those were the prime hours. Everyone wanted them. But earlier in the day, there would be these big gaps of time where I was wide open. And I loved getting people who wanted to come in at 11, 12, 1 p.m. Because those, those were hours where I was just kind of sitting there. And if I can see more people at that time, I might see less people in the evening and I can go home earlier and then be with my family and have a little bit better sense of... Um, of, of just being able to be at home and being at work and not being overwhelmed by it. So one of the things that I would offer from time to time is if people could come at these less desirable times, I would slide my scale. What that means, having a sliding scale means that you do rotate your fee downward in certain circumstances. I would do that for scheduling issues. I would also do that if, if a um, client of mine lost employment, but they still wanted to continue with mental health support from me, I would slide my scale down. Um, I would also make exceptions for people who um, were in very unique circumstances where they really wanted to see an expert in a certain condition that I was an expert in. They've tried elsewhere, they can't afford uh, my full fee, and they're in a tough spot. And I would always try to balance things out so I could have a few people at a sliding scale so that I'm not burning myself out, but I'm also able to just do what feels right for me and do what feels ethically and morally right. So a lot of therapists do the same stuff. They offer some type of sliding scale. So see if you can negotiate based on um, whatever uh, flexibility you have in your life right now. Another more affordable option for you to pursue is group therapy. I love group therapy. I loved being in group therapy. I loved doing group therapy. And for certain conditions like social anxiety, um, life transitions, grief and loss, for those types of problems, group therapy is often the better way to get treatment than individual therapy. And because group therapy might have 
four, five, six people in it, sometimes a bit more than that, it tends to be much more affordable, usually a fraction of the cost of seeing one-to-one -one, um, therapist to patient. So think about group therapy and think about the options that are out there. Usually it's a much more affordable way to go. So you found someone who you're interested in seeing. Here are the questions you need to ask. First and foremost, how much is this gonna cost me? What is the cost of the initial evaluation? That first session with a therapist is very different than every session that's to come after that. The first session is sort of you telling your whole life story and them asking a lot of questions to try to figure out what problem you're experiencing and the right treatment for you. It tends to be a longer session, a more intense session. It tends to cost a lot more, but then everything after that tends to be 45, 50 minutes long. Uh, the fee for that tends to be less than an initial evaluation. So ask, what's the cost of initial evaluation? What's the cost of ongoing treatment? Um, how do you handle billing? Uh, what about reimbursement? Do I have to submit to my insurance? Or are you gonna submit to your insurance? Get very clear on what is this gonna cost me? How does payment work? How is this gonna work with your insurance? Get all the details to see, is this even affordable for me? You need to know all that stuff way before you even step foot in that person's office or click join on their Zoom therapy session. Then ask the person, how much experience do you have treating this problem that I'm experiencing? A lot of people will give you the advice of asking, what's your theoretical orientation? Are you cognitive behavioral therapist? Are you a dialectical behavioral therapist? Are you psychoanalytic? Are you psychodynamic? Are you rational emotive? Are you act? I don't really find that advice too helpful for a, a few reasons. One, you probably don't have any clue what all those differences are. And two, in my experience, there are people who say they do a certain theoretical orientation, but that not, might not be what they actually do. So in my experience, I found it more helpful to ask a potential therapist, what experience do you have treating my problem? And then um, where did you get that training? Um, how many cases have you treated that are like mine? Those types of questions will give you a lot more detail to know, is this the right type of person for me? I also love asking potential therapists what types of things are going to get in the way of this therapy and what are the kind of things that are gonna make it a success. This is a really great way to see what understanding does this therapist have about both the problem I wanna get help for as well as the treatment that they are going to provide. If someone asks me about what are the types of challenges that come up with OCD treatment, I can list off a number of things that will give them a sense of confidence in how much experience I have, as well as help them understand, is this the right time for me to not only seek out therapy, but with this individual and the way that they practice. So ask, what is gonna make this therapy successful and what's gonna get in the way of making the type of improvement that I want? Ask this potential therapist, how will we measure progress? It can be really hard to know if you're making the type of progress you want in therapy. And I like setting expectations right at the get-go. How are we gonna know if this is working? How are we gonna reevaluate things if they're not working? How am I gonna know when it's time to end treatment? If your therapist can't really answer those questions, then I'm not feeling too good about their sense of transparency as well as their understanding of this treatment. So get very clear about what is going to be measured in this treatment. The last question I want you to ask is about boundaries. What are the boundaries going to be between you and me? How is communication going to be handled in between sessions? A lot of therapists might not bring up boundaries until a boundary has been crossed, but things like late night long emails or frantic calls in the middle of the night when you're going through some type of crisis. These things need to be talked about in advance. Some therapists have 
more boundaries. Some therapists have no online presence, don't deal with email, they will not take your voicemails. Other therapists have more flexible boundaries and every therapist is entitled to setting boundaries in whatever way feels right to them. But before you decide to work with that person, you need to know what is my access to this individual? Where can I have flexibility? What is inflexible? It's gonna go a long way to preventing later problems in treatment. So you found someone, you asked all these questions, now you gotta make this decision. Should I work with this individual? The first thing I want you to think about is, do you trust them? This is more of a gut feeling, and it's hard for me to operationalize it in some type of logical way, but I, I, I want you to trust your gut. I want you to trust your feeling. Did you feel good about their answers? Do you feel like there's a potential for you to work together? Did you feel like they really listened to you and understood you? All of that stuff is gonna go into that gut feeling and trust your gut on whether or not you feel good about working with this person. Ask yourself if they're transparent about the way they practice. And what I mean by transparency, are they very clear about billing? Are they very clear about the treatment, about what it's gonna look like, about how progress is gonna be measured? Are they very clear about their procedures? Have you been able to find their licensing number and can you verify that it's an active license in the state that you work in? Therapy is not supposed to be this mysterious, secret thing. It's basically an expert, like a coach or teacher, that's working with you in a trusting relationship to help you make progress on your goals that are based on some type of scientifically supported treatments. That's therapy. And if the person can't be transparent about how they operate with all of these different kind of things, that's a big red flag to me. If things don't really make sense or if you ask questions, you didn't feel good about the answers you got, that's a big red flag. Maybe that's not someone that you wanna work with right now. By the way, all these types of questions that I've mentioned that you should ask, some of these questions you should be able to ask through unpaid time with this therapist, whether that means a short phone call where you get to ask all these questions or a short consultation in person or video meeting. A lot of these questions, especially around fees and billing and availability, these should be answered without having to spend a dime seeing this person. If they're charging you before they're answering any of these questions about procedures and billing and all of that sort of stuff, that's a big red flag as well. The other thing I want you to ask yourself is, did you feel heard? Did you feel like this person actually listened to you? Did you feel like they asked a lot of follow-up questions to make sure they really got what you're going through? Did you feel like they were responding to the most important parts of your identity and who you are? All of those things are so important. And a question I get often is, do I need to have some type of identity match with uh, the therapist I'm working with? So if I'm South Asian, will it be better if I work with a South Asian therapist? If I'm LGBTQ+, will it be better if I'm working with someone who's LGBTQ+, and it really comes down to what helps you to feel heard and understood. And sometimes what's gonna help you to feel more heard and understood and, and safe is going to be with someone who has an identity match. Sometimes it's going to be about someone who's really responsive to your unique cultural background and the life that you've lived. But getting to that, did you feel like they heard your story? Did you feel like they really listened? If so, that's a really great sign that you might be able to have a trusting relationship that can help you to move forward. Notice what I didn't say. I didn't say anything about social worker, marriage and family therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist. 
I don't care about credentials. I've worked with people who have the most amazing credentials, come from the most amazing programs, but are really bad therapists. They don't really listen. And I've worked with people who come from programs that you've never heard of before, but they're incredibly compassionate, caring individuals who know their stuff. Credentials, degrees, training experiences, None of those really correlate with finding someone who really listens and understands and knows how to help you to move forward. Just find someone who feels good to you, gives you a sense of confidence and meets all the stuff I've been talking about. Don't worry about degrees and credentials and all of that sort of stuff. If none of this works, therapy is still elusive and inaccessible to you, I want you to think about going to a support group. Support groups are run by other people who have also experienced the things that you might be going through right now. They're not mental health professionals, but they are peers who might have life experiences that can help you to better understand what you're going through, help you to feel a little bit less alone, get you connected to resources or books or movies or other things that might help you to kind of think about what can I do to move forward on, on in, in my life. And support groups are way more affordable than uh, professional mental health support. There's online support groups that are just text-based. There's in-person support groups. There's video, Skype, Skype, who uses Skype anymore? Zoom based support groups. So find a support group that might work for you. Just remember that there might be a bit more trial and error associated with support groups until you find the right fit of people that really make you feel comfortable talking about the things that you're going through. What advice do you have about finding a therapist? Let me know in the comments below. If you want more videos about how therapy works, check out this playlist right over here. And for more videos about mental health, check out this playlist. And as always, for more videos that celebrate mental health, make psychology fun and easy to understand, subscribe to The Psych Show.